Welcome to the Run It Once podcast. How are you doing, Jennifer? You're about to uh, go on your hero's journey. Looking forward to it? Yeah, very much so. Thank you so much for having me, Lee. Oh, it's a real pleasure. Really excited for this one. You're our first female guest uh, of season one. So, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm going to ask you a random question to start out because I don't believe in these simple, nice little icebreakers. I like to smash, smash into it like Titanic. So I'm going to give you five categories, and then you can choose one of these categories to answer a question on, right? So you've got a choice of family, sex, money, relationships, or career. Oh, um, just random question related to that thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go with money. Let's go with money. Okay. I'm going to ask you a question. You can fold twice, but you have to answer the third one, okay? No matter how okay. trauma- no matter how traumatic it might be to you. Okay. Let's have a look. Money. What was the most foolish financial decision that haunts you in the small hours of the night? Um, I would have to say used to be buying my first house, then um, not putting enough money into crypto. Where, where do you where do you stand on the um, buying a home versus renting? Because I noticed you interviewed James Altucher the other day, and kudos uh, to you on that. It was a great interview, and he's a real component of never buying a house. Um, I'm stuck in the middle of kind of like I really want a house on my own nest, but I'm not quite sure if I should rent. Where do you lie on that one? Hey, well, I think as poker players, it makes a lot of sense to rent. And I had not read James Altucher um, before I bought that house. So afterwards, I, I really regretted it. But it turned out okay. But, you know, it's just like poker. Just because something turned out okay doesn't mean it was a good decision, right? Yeah, you got to yeah, look at yeah. the flip side, too. But, yeah, James Altucher is really well known for showing how the current career path is so multifaceted. And sometimes you find yourselves in, in different careers for one lifetime. So you have to move a lot. And when you own a home, it like makes you more shackled to one place because of all the transaction costs. So yeah, I um, I did regret that for a little while. And what 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 are your views on money? So let me rephrase that because that's like a massive uh, a question, I guess. Let's go back to the beginning. So where did you grow up? Okay, what type of neighborhood did you grow up? And what were your earliest memories around money and how it shaped your kind of belief system and how you grew up as a young girl? That's a great question. Well, I actually grew up right in here in Philadelphia, which I live now in the city, not the suburbs. So as a city girl, went to public school, um, walked to school. Um, we almost never got in a car. So yeah, I, as for my earliest memories of money, I, I think I'm lucky to say that I don't have a lot of them. And I think that's usually a good thing. I think it's amazing if you can uh, have a lifestyle where you're not feeling like you have lots of money and you need to brag about it, but you're also not feeling super in want of, you know, being able to go on a class trip or play a chess tournament. So I feel really lucky that I um, had that. I mean, of course, there were some things we wanted to do, like that we couldn't like play a chess tournament in Hawaii, for instance. Mm. But um, until we started qualifying and getting our airfare paid for. Um, but I, yeah, I, I was very fortunate in that way, I think. Um, if I had to think of an early memory of money, it probably would be related to something that I couldn't do um, like that. I, 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 but I really I can't think of it right now, like a chess tournament that I wanted to play in um, and couldn't because of money. Uh, but there were... Like I said, I, we started to get good enough that we were able to get our expenses paid to go. So, I was uh, 35 years of age before I kind of the light went on in my mind, and I realized that I, actually I can do anything that I want in the world if I really apply myself. You know, I don't have to be stuck in this one job. Um, I look at your life story, and you found chess at a very young age. It's obviously still an amazing part of your life right now. How do you ever think back about how fortunate it is to find something that you love so much at such a young age? I mean, how how did it, what's your thoughts on that? And how did you first get into chess? Well, I actually didn't like it right away. I didn't I wasn't very adept at chess when I first uh, discovered it. My brother and my father were both, I think, um, 
different, different type of brain than mine and uh, caught on more quickly. I'm a bit more of like a slower learner, but then when I get it, it um, accelerates very quickly. So uh, I took a break from chess feeling that I wasn't very talented at it because my learning curve was not um, really on the same path as my brother's. So I went into other things like acting and writing. Um, it's around the age of 12 or 13, a little younger, maybe 11 or 12. And then I got back into chess at 13 and really just went full force ahead with it. Uh, I do think that chess is a remarkable game for young people because it introduces you into the flow experience, um, probably similar to music, although I never was a music, music person, um, at a super young age. And, you know, that, of course, can translate into anything you do in life. So your, your introduction to chess, was that largely through your father's involvement in it and your brother's involvement? Yes. Yeah. So I do remember learning um, the piece movements when I was like five or six. And then I played like my first chess tournament in, as I recall, Disney World in Florida. I was going to just be tagging along with my brother and going on rides, but I ended up actually playing the tournament. I won my first game and my opponent said he couldn't believe I played so well for an unrated player. And I just, I I always remember that because I was like kind of sure I was going to lose my first tournament game. And, but that, like I said, was not a story of, of rapid success and glory after that moment. In fact, uh, a few years after that game, I actually quit chess for a couple of years. So I really stagnated. How old was you when you won that first tournament? I must've been in third grade, which would have been like nine years old, eight or nine, I'd say. Okay. Nine I, years old. So I have an 18 year old boy and you know, I raised him very differently than the way that I raised my three-year-old because obviously I'm a lot older, a lot more experienced now, and I've learned a lot more. But the way that I would have raised him in the beginning when we were sport, I think I would have, I would have, well, I know I did, was like drive him to win, right? Like drive him to win, to compete hard, to never leave, like like leave everything on the field because he, he used to play soccer, right? Um, but now when I fit into that same kind of modus operandi with my daughter, my wife is very quick to pull me up, right? I don't want her to be competitive. I don't want her to think like that. I just want her to have fun. I don't want it to be a competition. Well, how are you being driven at nine by your parents? First question. And second question, were you comfortable with that? Or was you tr- did you always want to like go against the way? What was your gut feeling as a nine-year-old competitor? Oh, my parents were both pretty chill. They wouldn't really push us, at least not outwardly. Um, I think like we kind of knew because children are so smart about emotions. We knew that my father, um, who is a very strong chess player himself, wanted us to win, but he tried his best not to show it. And also because he's such a strong chess player, there was a limit to how much he cared. Like he cared, but he knew that if like you were getting better, you were going to start winning anyway. Right. It's, it's uh, specifically in chess, the way the rating system works is if you start getting good and your rating is low, it accelerates much more quickly. So it, it wasn't as big a concern for him. And I think that's great. Oh, that's wonderful if you can not care that much because the children pick up so quickly on parents' emotions. And if, you, if they feel like they disappointed you, that I think could be really traumatic. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And, and, and I think about social media these days as well. And how, how would I be if I lived in a world of social media, you know, because I was always one of those kids who needed to fit in uh, mm-hmm. rather than belonging. So I always cared what people thought of me externally. And, um, you know, so, you know, my, my kids going through that at the moment, I worry a little bit about Razia, how she's going to deal with that you didn't necessarily have the social media, but you're still thrust into a competitive environment where people are playing a the game. There's going to be a winner. There's going to be a loser. Uh, the guy uh, or the guy or the woman who you played in that first game said to you, Oh, you played really well as an unrated player. Um, how did, how did you feel about that? Did you feel any pressure, any stress? Uh, how, how did it feel? And I'm taking you back a long time, but um, what was going on in your head back then about comparisons and, and that kind of stuff? Well, yeah, I did feel a lot of stress about not being as high rated as my family because actually my reading was pretty good for a kid, 
But it's, I, I remember somebody telling me that they would expect me to be much better considering my father and brother were so high rated. Um, somebody random, like not like a close friend or something. And yeah, I, I guess I was affected by that. I felt like, wow, that is odd. I guess maybe this is just not the game for me. So that is why I quit for a few years. Did that answer your question? Yeah, 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 sure it did. Um, and then as you grow older a little bit, you are, again, I'm probably interested in this because I've got a three-year-old and I'm, I'm really nervous about her growing up. What's what? her birthday? Uh, she is September. So she just turned three. Okay, she so she's... Three. So she's just two months older than uh, my son, Fabian. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I mean, I was going to ask you about this, actually. I, I think, uh, I don't know. I think very differently about having a boy than I do a girl. I worry about more about my girl than I do as a boy. And my wife's always saying to me, you may want to stop that thinking, but I can't stop it. Um, how did it, how did it, how was it growing up as a teenager in Philly, like a teenage girl? Uh, given the fact that, you know, we've got a pretty patriarchal society and I'm reading a book called Powerarchy at the moment by Melanie Joy, which is fantastic and talks about power structures, particularly male, female genders. So I'm always interested. What was your life like growing up as a teenager, which is going to be the most tumultuous time of your life? Well, I would say that my life as a teenager got remarkably better. I I, I had a miserable um the the years right before a teenager, like maybe 12, okay, so maybe 12 to 13 or 11 to 12, mm. um, I was really miserable because I was bullied quite in, intensively in uh, junior high school. So actually, I felt like the world completely opened up in high school because the meanness kind of stopped and I got really good at chess. So I started traveling the world. I made friends. My kind of weirdness started to sometimes work for me. Like people thought it was cool that I was like a little weird and played chess and traveled all over the world to do so. Um, whereas in junior high, I felt that me being a little different um, was an easy way to mock me, whereas it started to become almost a positive in high school. So I, I felt like I was pretty uh, happy as a high schooler comparat- comparatively, you know, it, when I look back on it, I, I can't help but smile because it was like such a big difference, you know, in those few years. What was the um, weirdness that people were um, focusing on when you was 10, 11? You know, I think there were a few things. I wasn't as, uh, I guess I was, I didn't have a lot of friends, so I probably didn't project a lot of confidence. So that always makes you easy to bully. Um, I was a little younger. I was basically, you know, half a year to a year younger than most of the kids in my grade. So there was that. And I was probably in my own world a lot, just kind of like lost in space. You know, that's kind of a characteristic that I feel like I had a lot when I was a kid. Uh, but what, whatever the reason was, I, I was, I was usually like they had this pre-social media like ways to taunt people, and I was usually the subject of that, like. Um, these books where they would write like things about everybody in the class. And like most of the things were pretty nice. And then like my page was like all mean stuff. And like, it was like an anonymous, right? Like, Mm. so you can imagine this is like a precedent to internet trolling. Right. Mm. And yeah, that, uh, that it was, it was definitely one of my strong memories of junior high. And then when I think of high school, I think of having friends and going to like Brazil and Iceland for chess tournaments. So you can see like, there's like a big, (laughs) Huge there was a big jump. There was a big jump in my life. Now, yeah. so, now suddenly everybody wants to be your best friend. Right? <laughs> let's, get, let's get a trip to Brazil. My daughter has just started preschool, and her teach her teacher has been telling us that yesterday was the first time in in three weeks that she's been going there that she's actually moved and 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 gone into a group to play. So she said that she would stay on her own. She she didn't want to go in the group. She wanted to to play on her own. And I said to my wife, I would love, like if I had a genie right now, I'd rub it in and I'd want to be in her head for 10 minutes just to, just to kind of experience what she's talking to herself about when she's looking at these kids. Um, I'm going to ask you the same question. Now it's probably a difficult one because it's a long time ago, but what were you thinking about when, you know, you said she was, you know, pretty isolated. What were you thinking about when you saw groups of people? 
Yeah, I think I was thinking it would be nice to be more integrated and popular, but I think there are different types of children. Some of them like to be part of a group and some of them are more comfortable with smaller groups, like one-on-one or even like three, a group of three. It's really overwhelming for a lot of children to be in huge groups. I've noticed that with my son as well. He's a uh, very... Uh, he's very um, extroverted and fun when it's two or three kids. But if it's a group, it's like overload. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Like if you are a child, it's almost like having your conscience open and your, your consciousness open and you're just like aware of everything. Right. As adults, we're able to filter that and turn off the channels that we're not paying attention to. Right. Whereas I can imagine for a kid, it's just like, there's so many channels open and it's overwhelming and then you just want to go in the corner. Especially if as parents, you're, you're helping to open those channels. So if you're talking to your children about emotions, how are you feeling and, 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 and all that kind of thing, I guess when they go to school, it's a lot different than when I went to school when I was not having those conversations. You're just like this hammer. <laughs> Come on, I want to play. I want to play, you know? So yeah, I totally get that. Um, so we talk about, oh, look, before I move on to this, actually, one more question. Uh, that bullying that you had at 10 to 11, I asked Andrew Lichtenberger the same question because uh, he was uh, um, subject to bullying when he was younger. How did that shape you and affect you as you grow through life? Like, you know, how, what, how has it shown up in your life? Well, I would like to say that it taught me the importance of kindness and um, thinking independently because I, I I always remember that there were all these mean things, but there were somebody who wrote like a couple of nice things. And I guess, I, I don't know, but somehow I knew who it was. Maybe that, maybe some people signed it and some people didn't. I'm not sure exactly how it worked, but I definitely knew who wrote the nice things. And I, I always remember that because I feel like that's when it's hard when it's a social status to be mean to people and to bully people and to gossip, um, to stand up and be the person who doesn't do it. And hey, we encounter it all the time. Even today, you know, you're in some corporate environment and somebody says something sexist and you have to be the one to say like, you know, something against it instead of just playing along. It's, it's, it's often not easy. You have to risk something to do that. So I, I like to think of that as, a precedent for being more aware that the important times to be kind is not when everyone else is doing it, but when it's hard because other people aren't doing it and you're going to look like kind of an ass even. I know that sounds crazy, but you're going to look like an ass because it's like you're not doing what everybody else is doing and it's going to make them hold up a mirror to how mean they are. So that's, that is the resistance, but it's like mm. good that you're doing that. Yeah. Well, I guess right? when, when you're 10 or 11 and you're subject to it, you, you kind of, desperate for someone to stand up for you in that moment because you don't want to go to tell the teacher because it makes it even worse. You don't want to get your parents involved. It makes it even worse because now you can't really can't stand up for yourself. You kind of really need someone to go, Hey, that, you know, that's not fair. So yeah, I was bullied you, when I was younger. Yeah, and, I, and, and I'm, I, if I was at a poker table, for example, and saw someone bullying someone, I, I would have to say something. Yeah. And that's why it's hard. I think because it, it, you, it's that sense, like, why are you taking this so seriously? You know, like it's, it was just a joke. Right. So I think that's the risk that the person who, you know, blows, <laughs> blows a whistle or who says like, stop takes because they look like, they look like they're kind of like a hard ass, but mm. you know, I think when in doubt go that direction. And if you can go in that direction and be kind of funny, at the same time, well, then, hey, you win, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be strategic. Be strategic yeah. about your bullying interventions. I, you know, in the old um, archetype of story, Joseph Campbell's story, he says the hero starts off in an ordinary world and then they receive the call to adventure. It sounds like when you were younger um, that your call to adventure eventually became chess. But was it always chess? Because you did a few other things as well. You said, like, acting and stuff. Like, how... How would you, what would you say was your call to adventure when you was younger? It doesn't have to be binary. It can be more than one thing, I guess. I definitely think that chess was the main vehicle for adventure because I saw it as a way to travel the world quite young. I mean, I love the game. So it was also an adventure into my own mind. But I was very aware of the fact that for somebody like me, it was, it was the only way to be able to, you know, go to, you know, 
dozens of countries, you know, before I graduated college and meet so many different people. And I would often like tack on time to the end of my trips to see the world. And I know you don't mean adventure super literally, like it it has to be like traveling to Mm. China or Europe. But for me, that I think was just a way into so many different worlds. And I'm so grateful for it in retrospect, because obviously, once you have a family, the appeal of travel becomes like a lot lower. So that was- a lot that's an understatement of century. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, it's like it takes me three hours to get out of the house in the morning just to take her to the gym. Imagine taking her to Brazil for a week, you know. Um I often talk to people about when they get that call to adventure, that they almost have to rip themselves off the path of least resistance to, to take that call. But I'm, I'm kind of struggling in my head to imagine you on a path of least resistance. And what I mean by that is, Jen, is, you know, kid goes to school, kid goes home, kid grabs a football, goes out on the pitch, comes home, uh, has his dinner, goes to bed, does the same thing, right? And then as he gets older, he gets a job in a nine to five, works Monday to Friday, drinks and, and gets drunk on the weekend type of thing. That, that's my path of least resistance. But it doesn't sound like you as kind of, touched by that it seems almost like you were born and then boom you know there's the adventure Uh, is that how it really was it's so hard for me to envision a path of least of least resistance in america because it's so tough in the united states you know we don't have national health insurance or child care so i guess if you could I guess the the path of least resistance i guess and i I don't want to be sexist because this could be men or women would be, you know, marrying somebody with a lot of money and then, you know, not working. It seems like almost anything you do or, or somehow having a family member who had a job for you where you didn't really have to work a lot. Mm. Like, no matter what, in the United States, if you want to succeed, you have to, to work pretty hard, I think, in almost any field you go into. I mean, one especially of the, if you want to have a family one day, right? Well, I mean, the family is really interesting because one of the discussions I have with Liza and my wife a lot is, is Liza's recognition that um, we had a we had a child, and then we have to figure out who's going to keep on working and who's going to kind of look after the child and whether or not we want to split the work and split the child raise, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then somewhere along the line, when I I work and take care of Zia, but obviously not as much as as, as Liza does. Somewhere along the line, Liza s- starts to realize that she's given away her she's given away her power, and she doesn't feel good with that. But she's aware that she's doing it because it's easy. It feels easy to her to like kind of sit back because, you know, in a way, like, oh, I'm getting, I'm being looked after here, kind of thing. And 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 then she's, oh, I don't like. That's not who I am. That's not my kind of that my my person. That's who I want to be. So I guess there's a there's a path of least resistance in your head as well as uh, as uh, externally. Have you ever been touched by any of those kind of thoughts before? That I'm not resisting. Um, yeah, about, I start, about taking your foot off the gas. Yeah, and being, yeah, just kind of coasting. I mean, mm. I'm always. I don't really relax a lot. So, like, yeah, when I go to like a masseuse or something, they're like, um, relax, and I'm like, wait, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, what do you mean? <laughs> so, um, in that respect, no. But I guess there are some things that you can do where your chances of failing aren't very high. So you could consider that a path of least resistance in some way, right? Mm, yeah. So you're afraid of success rather than afraid of failing. Or when you're, when you're not, you're not risking failure. So therefore maybe the risk isn't very high. So that could feel like an easier path in a lot of cases, I guess. What is it? Yeah. What is it that you're not risking today? What am I not risking today? Wow, that's a good question. It's just uh, today, like right. You mean no, you don't no, mean no. like right now? No, no, not not literally. What what is it that you know you should be doing right now, but you're putting it off because of resistance? Mm, path that leads to resistance. Well, I would say definitely financially. When you have a family, you stop taking as many risks with money, which is always very dangerous because. Um, a low risk uh, financial strategy is also like a high risk one long term, right? That's the funny thing about risk. Like low risk in the short term is high risk in the long term because um, if everybody else is investing money in ways that makes a big return and you're not, then like because of inflation, you're going to have less money. But I feel like that's a kind of hard concept to wrap your hand around. 
So I've been trying to resist that in terms of working even harder to look for um, some passive income streams and, you know, just continuing to burn the mid- midnight oil to like combine the uh, steady work with uh, other other sources that require more risk. I mean, on that, James Altucher talks a lot about uh, the importance of having multiple streams of income. And only this week, I, I was I almost had a light bulb moment where I, I found myself trying to get too binary. So like I have a dream, right? I have a dream and, and a mission in life and I earn money and the two are, are separate, right? And I, and, I, and I say to myself all the time, I need to get to a point where I'm not doing these making money things. I'm doing 100% of my dream, which is also making me money. Um, but, but I started to realize that actually that's the wrong way to think about it. And I could do lots of different things and earn money through lots of different ways, not just the dream. Have you, have you ever had thoughts like that? Like how, what's your view on multiple streams of income? Um, not just money, but time. Like have you ever felt that you've spread yourself too thin? So what's your whole view on Altucher's uh, concept of multiple streams of income and, and time, I guess? Well, I think it's great that, uh, you're you figured out what your dream is and that you're trying to merge that more with your money making scheme um what is your dream by the way i help people quit alcohol Uh, okay yeah well that's great because that is uh yeah when i was signing up for the podcast link it uh yes it's it's totally it says alcohol addiction podcast you're thinking i'm I'm going on the wrong podcast here (laughs) no i actually have the opposite problem i have to tell you lee i mean i do like an occasional drink but a lot of times at like networking events, I have, especially with Brits, no offense. No, no, no. <laughs> that, that's why I'm I helping to, people. I have to pretend that I'm drinking more than I actually am. <laughs> 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 because, you know, people like you to drink with them, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, I'm like, you know, trying to pretend that I'm ha- I'm having more or drinking wine and really I'm just like drinking and then abandoning it. I get it. <laughs> you know. Yeah, just, yeah. I, not something that I do all the time, but I, I also have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of mood swings. Um, and sometimes I'm in just such a good mood, uh, especially around other people that people think I was like really tipsy and I like didn't have a thing to drink. So it's a, it's a funny, it's a funny relationship, but I completely sympathize with people who have less fun relationships with alcohol. So I think mm. what you're doing is really awesome. I mean, I read a book recently that you would probably, you've probably already read by Leslie Jameson called The uh, the Recovering, a really great book no, about al- mm. alcoholism and, oh, it's beautifully written. And I, I was really able to relate better to alcoholism ever since reading that book. But anyway, the question was about something totally Multi- different about- Yeah, multiple, multiple streams of income and time, because I, I think uh, they're kind of the same. Yeah, I'm, I, I definitely have a bit of a weakness in that I'm spread too thin. Um, it's it's kind of nice for some projects because, and, and one thing, because I know that it's like a little bit of my weakness to spread myself too thin, I try to find certain types of projects that actually make that weakness into a strength, hmm. like podcasting or writing a book with a lot of different um, stories and um, characters, because if you spread yourself too thin, one of the good things is you tend to make a lot of connections, right? From all the different worlds that you're in and you tend to gain like that level of trust with people. Um, Like for you and some of the work that you do, I I think that that's probably immensely valuable just to have so many um, friendships or business relationships in poker and beyond. Mm. And so I, I think that what's cool about James Altucher and the concept of multiple income streams is that it really kind of predated this side hustle idea, right? Yeah. Now that multiple income stream has a kind of sexier name, the side hustle, which I have really mixed feelings about because I think that it's really great not to be dependent on one source of income for both psychological reasons and practical reasons. But I also think it's scary that in the United States, uh, side hustle is something that people might now need to get by you know, to pay for groceries and their car payments, not just to, um, you know, help them with security and, you know, maybe start a business. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's concerning that the wealth divide in the United States is so great that a lot of people feel that they have to get a side hustle to get by because the word hustle itself to me denotes that 
they're trying to do it to move up. So is James Collin, I haven't read his book and I haven't listened to his podcast for a very long time, but is James Collin the side hustle, the thing that you don't really want to do to make money? Or is he just saying that your side hustle can be something that you love and something that you don't like? Oh, I think the side hustle is something that you like that you do on the side so that you have the power to quit your job if you need to. Oh, so the or, his side, his side hustle is your meaning and purpose, your vocation, your dream, that type of stuff. Not necessarily. Your side hustle is maybe something that you quit your job and then the side hustle is a, offers a better hourly rate. So then you can do your dream in like the rest of the day while you set your own hours for the side hustle. Okay. I think that's kind of like that. That seems to be more of the vision to me, like from, from talking to him. Hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, I love to see a lot of people do that with poker. Some people love the game and just want to play poker all the time, but it seems like a lot of people use the fact that they're their own boss and they can kind of compress hours and spread hours into kind of weird configurations so that if they want to spend um, a big chunk of their other time on charity work or on recovery and addiction um, and culinary school, it seems that a lot of poker players have really found ways to um, incorporate that ethos of you know, doing your, your side hustle in your own time and then figuring out your dream and what you love and the rest of the time. Well, I, I'm in the middle of it. I'm nearly finished a, a big article I'm doing called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Poker Players. And one of the one of the habits that didn't make the cut, but it was very close, was to take take time away from poker. So the habit was to mm-hmm. take time away from poker to do things. That fits in with what you're talking about with the side hustle. So rather than just taking the time away from poker to do some meditation or go for a walk, is actually take time away to do something that eventually when you leave poker is is going to be something that you fall in love with that offers value, trying to value to people and as a as a nice side, you know, pays your bills, you know? Yeah, no, I think it's so important just for poker players also to remain interesting. You know, there's a lot of talk now about getting into private games and I think that part of it is, sure, I'm having a good personality, but something I'm always aware of you know, having a child and spending so much time on chess and poker is reading and listening to podcasts and talking to people about stuff outside my spheres because I just want to make sure that I retain like the ability to have an interesting conversation with anyone. <laughs> yeah. My, um, my, the person mm-hmm. who, the person who hires me when I work for Triton, uh, Triton, tournament i do the interviews for i am high stakes poker he's always taking the piss at me he's always saying did you read that in a book did you read that in a book did you read that in a book because when i'm interviewing people you know i'm always saying oh this book this book because it, it it's a good way of connecting with people because it you know but simply the fact that you're reading is you're expanding your knowledge and your awareness and you know your internal network like i've never met james altiger but but knowing that i listened to his podcast for years and that you interviewed him allows us to connect on a kind of a you know um, a level, right? So, yeah. I mean, talking about books, actually, I would say some of my greatest mentors have, have come out of literature and I've never even met them. Uh, as you were young, moving over into the special world, who were the biggest mentors in your life? Also, I felt that a lot of them came from books. I mean, I had some great chess coaches, um, including my dad and my brother. Then there was a, a, some people that came into Philadelphia to coach us from time to time. Um, but I, I felt that uh, books were a huge part of my upbringing. Um, I always loved them, spent so many hours in the library. My favorite thing to do after school was to go to Barnes and Noble and like get a hot chocolate and just like read and read and read. Um, in chess, there was a great writer called Dovoretsky who wrote these incredibly difficult chess books, the kind of thing where if I got one position right, I would feel great and it might take me an hour. And I was already a really good chess player. I was already like a master. So I I definitely felt that um, for me, I've always had this incredible love for books. I mean, even though poker and book is not really like the perfect format, I still almost always, if a poker player writes a book, I just want to read it because I'm curious about how they're going to translate their ideas about the game in that format. Outside of chess, are there any nonfiction books that have really made a change in your life and what changes were they? Um, made a change. Uh, well, uh, nonfiction is something I really like lately, actually. I really liked Andrea Dworkin. She's a radical feminist. 
uh, who was kind of uh, lambasted and criticized for being too radical. But the thing is, like a lot of times when people criticize, they don't actually read the book. So uh, people were saying she died a few years ago. Um, Andrea Dworkin, she's just a, f- a phenomenal writer. Like her sentences are like Nabokov. They're just stunningly beautiful sentences. Mm. Um, but she was, she was very radical and she said some stuff about how she tried to make a relationship between, I guess, certain types of sex and rape. And um, in some points people misinterpreted what she says that like rape is kind of a continuum of sex and that like all heterosexual sex is rape, which she didn't really ever write. Um, but they, they managed to like, you know, distill all of her work down to that point. And it was really a shame because she made a big effect on me in that I think she, her writing being so beautiful, like really made me kind of think about how your style can affect uh, what you say and how being a really beautiful writer can both persuade people, but also scare people. And what she also taught me was about how some of the great men of history who we read about, um, if they were like horrible to the women in their lives, how that affects what we think about them. Uh, she had a ch- big chapter on Tolstoy and about his relationships. And I, I remember really just being super affected by that book because it showed me the incredible powers of creative nonfiction. I mean, you, you, you put, uh, you talked about sex and rape and in my alcohol work that I do, we have a community called Strive and one of our key principles is to get comfortable being uncomfortable because uh, a lot of the reasons why we drink is because we, we're we not comfortable in our own skin. We don't like ourselves. And we're certainly not comfortable kind of talking and communicating with the world. And it's getting more challenging. You know, like if if uh, if we wanted to have a talk about rape and sex and about how the two intertwine and the blue lines, et cetera, et cetera. Like I personally, like with my platform, for example, of just writing about these kind of things in, in poker and just in life in general, I'd feel really uncomfortable going there. But, but Strive is like a safe haven for me where I can go and I can say, hey, this is something I've got on my mind and I want to talk about that, you know, which leads me like on a much diluted kind of uh, a, a thing here is the topless male dealers in Malta. Um, and I noticed uh, 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 nude women playing chess is a, a thing I, yeah, I, I see on your social media feed and I, I read the article, um, can't remember the... The, the people in the picture, but uh, how that is art, you know, like, like, how do you feel? Do you feel confident, uh, Jennifer, like that you're able to talk about anything? Uh, do you feel like, like handcuffed a little bit? Like, how do you feel in terms of freedom of speech today uh, in the world, given everything that's going on? That's a really great question because I think sometimes people are surprised by me because I'm like super hyper liberal on some things. And then I seem like remarkably centrist on other things, um, which I, which I like because I like to keep people guessing. I just like to think independently. So I, I usually, I usually don't fall on the right, but I'm usually either on the liberal, the very liberal side or like sometimes I'm very center. Um, and I, I really, depending on the situation, I can sometimes fall right in with cancel culture and say like, yeah, like we should cancel that person for saying that like racist, bigoted, horrible thing five years ago, because there's probably other people that can do what they're doing even better who never said those types of things. But then also also sometimes I think it's gotten completely out of hand and that people need to be more comfortable conversing. But the thing at the end is that it's very complicated. And I'll give one example in my own life that is very complicated, which is I am a big advocate for women in chess, for girls in chess. And something I realized, even when I wrote my very first book, Chess Bitch, was that you have to be careful about talking about the biological differences between women and men. And the reason is that it can be very discouraging to women and girls if you try to, as a non-scientist, explain that there are like these evolutionary or like chemical differences or, you know, and I think that that's valid. The fact that it's discouraging to people to sometimes talk about um, potential differences is 
a valid reason not to talk about it, especially if you're not a psychologist and you never went to med school, you never studied the brain. It was just based on something that you read in some book and you're not really an expert on it. So therefore, I think that there is some rationale for why we should be scared to say certain things because what we say influences the world around us. So it's not just about like, oh, I want to say this because it's true. It's also about like what kind of ripple effects might that have in the world, right? It's almost like poker. It's like um, like I'm not a, a great poker player because I I can't I don't take my time to make a decision and I don't logically think it through. There's no the intent uh-huh. the intent is not there. It's more of a gut thing. So and and similarly when it comes to discourse, um, I just bleh, I like I spew it out. Like I don't I don't think about what I'm going to say and whether or not I should say it or not. And this, this, this happens even in my work helping addicts. You know, I, I can sometimes um, really upset an addict because rather than, provide, rather than thinking it through and providing them with some empathic, supportive kind of comment, I just say, wow, that fucking really disappointed me right now. You know, it's just like I'm just saying what I think. Um, and I wish I could be more like what you're saying is kind of like, you know, just realize that there are some things you shouldn't say. So like, um, well, first thing I come to mind when you said about, you're not a scientist or, you know, a biologist or whatever is when I think about poker and women and men, one of, one of the things that comes up in my head is there is no difference um, mentally between a woman and a man playing poker. So therefore uh, they're on an even keel. Right. But that sentence in itself and that statement is coming from a power, a power, Mm-hmm. Um, a powerarchy, uh, a conditioning that has been that has been drummed into me from a very young boy, likely from my dad, right? Um, and a lot of people aren't aware of that. I'm aware of it. I, I can still say it, and then I'm like, oh no, I was way out of order. Then, you know, is do you get what I'm saying? It's like <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it's something I've thought about a lot. I mean, I think it can be very damaging, even potentially, to say, well, women and men are exactly the same. Um, so there should be no disadvantage for women in poker because actually, particularly in poker, it, it's not all about being smart. We know that. It's about who you know. It's about who you can know. It's also about how much money you have, how much people will trust you with money, how much money you can raise. And a lot of these things, especially in certain places, is going to be a lot easier for men because men have more wealth and men are often you know, raised to ask for um, money more confidently and in larger amounts. So I just think that poker is such a example that is not only about brain power. There, obviously, being intelligent plays very highly into poker, but it's it's one of many many skills. Chess a bit more pure about brain power, but even chess has a lot of these soft skills that come into it, like um, you know, networking to get to get certain coaches, conditions, to make friends with people that you can work on chess with. But that's one of the reasons we like chess because it's one of the purer activities there are in terms of mental. It's that time of the show that tempts you to press the fast forward button. But if you're new, don't do it. Phil Galfon founded Run It Once Poker, and in poker, he's a pretty big deal. It's one of the most fun places to play online poker, and it's such an amazing community as well. If you're lucky, you can also end up playing with Phil as he competes and streams on the site regularly. Although why you would want to sit next to the Albert Einstein of poker is beyond me. Head to once.run forward slash hero play today and you can pick up a 100% welcome bonus up to a ceiling of 600 euros. There are two elements to this deposit bonus that make me want to turn to prostitution to find that 600 euros. First, it never expires as long as you play one hand every 30 days. And second, all of your deposits during your first 30 days count towards the bonus. If you want to reach a point in your career where 600 euros is chicken feed, then run it once as you're back. Run it once training gives you the chance to learn from some of the best players in the world with two brand spanking videos every day. Okay. If you sign up through once.run forward slash hero learn, you will get access to free Three elite videos, including one from the Yoda of poker himself, Mr. Phil Galfon. Now back to the day's hero, Jennifer Shahadi. I am curious to ask you about this because I'm remembering now one of the things I like so much about this uh, Leslie Jameson's book. And I think what it was was that it showed 
to somebody, me, who's never experienced alcoholism, it showed me the positives of being really drunk. Like it, it gave me more of a rationale about why these people were addicted to alcohol. Cause when she goes through like the euphoria that she felt when she was drunk, it's very vivid. Whereas I feel like a lot of what's written about addiction, it only kind of shows you about the negative side of it and why it's so destructive to your life. So to me, but to me, that was kind of an eye opener because I'm like, okay, well, this is not just completely irrational, stupid activity by people who are like, you know, unable to control themselves. This is somebody who's probably getting a bigger euphoria from the vice than I am. And that's why they're struggling. I mean, this, uh, we'll, we could talk about this because it has, it has, it runs parallel with uh, many things in life, you know, so uh, we can, we can go somewhere with this. Um, for me, for me, one of the biggest problems I find trying to help people who are stuck in the mire of alcoholism is they come to me thinking they really want to drink alcohol. And it's not until you start working with them and you take the form of their resistance. So you, you, you pretty much know what their resistance is going to be in terms of stopping because you've been there yourself and you work with so many people, so you know what they are. So, it, so you become their voice of resistance, right? So you then say to them, well, hang on a minute, Jen. You know, like you say you want to stop drinking alcohol, do you? Yeah, you'll do anything. Will you? Yeah. Okay. So um, let's write out a big list of all the things that, that make alcohol so wonderful because you've been drinking it for like two, three decades, right? So then you'll be writing things like, well, it helps me network in events because I, I, I get socially lubricated. So I loosen up a little bit. I'm, I think I'm more likable. Uh, people uh, really uh, gravitate towards me because they see I'm drinking and they're drinking. And if I wasn't, they might avoid me because they don't want to be drunk in the presence of someone who's sober, blah, 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 blah. Right. And they end up with this huge list. <laughs> and then you turn around and say, holy shit. Like if alcohol is providing you with that much value, like, why do you want to quit? And then the person's like, <laughs> and then it's this big pause. And then you help them to realize that if they, they can keep all those things, but company and all those things is loneliness, is disconnection, is um, the inability to communicate, is, is the inability to think straight, to have dreams. Well, you can have dreams, but you're never going to achieve them. Uh, and, and then what, what the trick is, is kind of like, you need to, you need to actually the pos- You need to get the positives of stopping drinking higher than the positives of drinking. So that's our our, um, our biggest issue. But my views on alcoholism, and we can turn this over to a question to actually. I believe that drinking alcohol is a belief system, uh, not just a belief system, but a very powerful oppressive belief system, and I call it alcoholism. And I call it alcoholism for a reason because belief systems with no names are invisible and that's what makes them run rampant, right? So um, so when people come to me, the way I help them quit is to see that they're actually a victim of a belief system and that they never had a conscious decision to drink alcohol. Um, they, they drink alcohol because people like us do things like this. You know, we drink alcohol because that's what we do. Give you an example. My boys just started a new job yesterday. Let's say at the end of the day, all his new workmates want him to go to the pub. What's he going to do? It's his his father's son. It's his father helps alcoholics. He is vehemently against drinking alcohol. And then what's he going to do? Well, of course he's going to drink, right? He's going to drink because it's his first day at work. It's the manly thing to do. It's it's, it's the the patriarchy thing to do. It's like, you know, he's going to drink, but he doesn't really want to drink. I know he doesn't because I have those conversations with him. So what, what are the belief systems? that have helped you progress in life? And what are some of the belief systems you think that have hindered you or you've strongly questioned or maybe still question? Well, I think that a belief system that's really helped me is that you can work anytime. And when you're in the mood to work, you should work and you shouldn't set a, like a, a rigid schedule. Like, for instance, that you relax at night and work during the day and then like at, you know, five o'clock you, you stop working. Like, I guess that's really helped me because a lot of my great work is in the middle of the night. And then during the day, a lot of times I spend with family or, you know, work out, exercise. So I think that's helped me my whole life, you know, that I've always been really open-minded about just burning the midnight oil and 
I, I think that if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't, I would have a lot less achievements. Um, and also going with my own psychological waves because I have a lot of, uh, you know, kind of times when it's hard to get stuff done because of my, my mood swings. And so I found a way to work within that. And I think that, you know, those, those uh, self-awareness has been very valuable. Things that work against me is probably my, my relationship with money being very, uh, I guess maybe a little bit more hedonistic than I would like it to be, you know? I don't know if hedonistic is the right word because it's not like I'm out there like buying like, you know, like Louboutins and like drinking champagne and like, you know, all that. I, I just, uh, I find that my relationship with money could be a little bit more frugal and I would still be able to have a lot of fun. And that can maybe save me for some more freedom later in life. Well, let's, well, let's ask you another question on money then. So we can kind of investigate this belief system a little bit more. Oh, that's a very personal question. I didn't think you were going to ask. I'm going to ask you anyway. How much money do you have? Don't forget, you can fold two out of three. <laughs> yeah, I probably should fold out. <laughs> um, <laughs> if so, if, is someone who earns very little money a sexual turn on or turn off? Earns little? Hmm. Um, I think it's almost irrelevant. I think that um, they can easily make up for it in other ways. Like you want somebody to be good at something and money is just one of many, many things like music, art, um, poker, <laughs> like chess. There are so many things that you can be good at that don't involve being good at making money, I guess. So being I, being good at making money is a turn on, but not being good at making money is not enough information yet. <laughs> My mother-in-law, <laughs> she's Korean, and she's always <laughs> she's always asking me how much money I make, and uh, and I'm sure it's not because she's just interested in how much money I make. It's because she needs to know that I'm looking after her daughter, right? Um, and and they're in their seventies, and my my father-in-law will come home. And they won't even, th- he'll, he'll like work 12 hours. He'll come on. They won't even talk to each other like uh, every day. And then she'll make uh-huh. him his food and, and that's it. And, and it, it, it gets me so angry. Um, what? And then my wife will say, yeah, but Lee, it's cultural. So what, what are your views around like cultures and the way that people kind of behave so differently and, uh, uh, is that something that you look upon and you respect? Is that something that you think, no, hang on a minute, we need this should change and that should change and wake the fuck up when I were in 2019? Um, where are you or what, what goes through your head when you think about those things? Well, you mean specifically people, a, a couple that doesn't seem to like talk a lot but have created a financial situation that kind of works for both parties? It could be, it could be anything that someone, someone um, passes the behavior away as okay because it's culturally that's okay like like how do you feel about people saying no, no, that's okay because that's the way that things are i think it really just depends on the thing i'm sorry but like that particularly i i think that it's hard because you might not have a good understanding of whether or not the relationship is positive privately right i think that uh in general though i get what you're saying that people shouldn't use the fact that something is okay culturally, like to justify it. I mean, that would go into eating meat. A lot of, I I do eat meat though. I try not to eat very much of it. Um, But I certainly don't believe that the excuse of other people doing it is a valid one, right? So why do you, in that, in that context then, why do you eat meat? Uh, You know, honestly, because when I've tried to quit, I've had, um, I, when I've tried to quit completely, like it's, I, I can go without eating. I can eat meat like once a week and that's mm. fine. But I find that if I quit completely, I have issues with my, my um, mental health. I, right. It sounds crazy, but I've Googled it and it seems like, um, it seems like it's not a rare common. It's not a rare problem that like there's probably supplements or something I need to research. Can we touch upon that a little bit? Because twice. Yeah, now, sure. Twice. I've come since- up- <laughs> no, no, come no. Up in your podcast. <laughs> no, no, no. Twice <laughs> since we've been talking, you've referenced your mood swings, mm-hmm. and, and now you just mentioned mental health. So, um, do you want to expand on that a little bit more? 
Well, yeah. I mean, I've never been, I've never taken any kind of medications. I feel like I'm just very, I'm very lucky that I'm able to have a lifestyle where I can make my life work for my moods. Um, but I, I do feel that I can sympathize with people who have depression because I think I'm right there in that borderline where I can get by without having to medicate or make any major life changes, especially if I exercise and eat well. But uh, I've, I, I definitely experienced some dis- depressive spells and some manic spells. And one of the reasons I've never done anything about it is like the manic spells are just, just so amazing. It's like I feel like a superhuman sometimes, especially after I've gotten out of a period of a few days where I've been in a funk. It's usually like it always comes up and the, the highs are really quite nice. Usually I get a lot of writing done um, or a lot of like, you know, projects done during those times. And so I just feel like it's worth it. What's happening when you're in a depressive state? Yeah, then I just don't. Um, I usually get a lot less done. And it's, uh, it, can, it, can get, it can get very dark. But if I'm able to control it with exercise and sleep, usually it's, it's uh, and I can recognize it. So you can see it's there and it's going to go away. Um, then uh, I'm, I'm able to get by. I mean, the only time it was really bad was when I was taking a medication, an unrelated medication, uh, birth control pills, which kind of flipped the switch and made me actually like, you know, really depressive. And then I really felt sympathy for depressive people because I could really see the dark side then. And you uh, know, that's, some, that's something, you know, you really want to avoid at all costs, obviously. So, and not everybody can. I think some people, unfortunately, chemically have that disposition and it's like such a, it's such a terrible disease. I know, I know that it's a really um, personal thing. So if you don't want to talk about it, it's, it's fine. It, it, it just... I like to ask the questions because I think it can help so many people watching this. Um, very often, uh, depression can be linked to a, a, a traumatic event, like a, an, an, an outstanding traumatic event that really shapes and, and turns into depression. But uh, very often as well, depression is just depression. It just, it just happens. There's, there's no traumatic event or certainly not one that we can think back to. Um, how, how, is, how did yours evolve? When did this start? Uh, uh, what what type of depression is it? I mean, if you could talk about it a little bit more, it'd be great. If you don't want to, I totally understand. Well, like I said, I felt like it was pretty controllable and I did associate the downs with the awesome ups, which was, you know, just so fun, you know, because it wasn't like so manic that people would like think there's something wrong with me. It was just people would think I was a life of the party. So I, I just really enjoyed those feelings. And so I was just like lived with it. But when I started taking birth control pills, it took a turn for the worst in which I'd have like some pretty bad panic attacks and even like, you know, uh, some, some very bad, uh, bad, like bad negative thoughts about like, you know, life being not even worth it. Mm. So uh, I just got off the birth control pills. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, <laughs> and then ended up having a baby <laughs> but uh but no 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 long long time ago and um i i couldn't i would maybe i was on them for maybe six months until i realized that until i made the connection that it was like definitely related like you know before that it was like oh maybe it's just like circumstantial like i'm just having a tough time and i think i at some point i was able to make the connection because maybe i got off them for a month and then I got back on and it was just very clear, like night and day. Um, and yeah, so I was pretty, I was pretty pissed for a while though, because I felt like at the time, maybe doctors are a little bit better about it now, but at the time I didn't feel like doctors were very sympathetic to me. Mm. It felt like they thought it was in my head, you know? And also it, it didn't, in the warning label, there was like 20 other things that they mentioned. It was like just some minor thing at the bottom, like, oh, maybe some mood things, you know? Yeah, uh, you'd get the same response if you saw a national health uh, specialist in in the UK. I think it's uh, again, it, it's it's another kind of belief system. Like if you if you go in there and you start talking to them and and telling them you want certain tests for gluten intolerance or you want to test if peanut butter makes you bloat, they just think that you just think you're nuts. They just think you're crazy. It's just like no, no, no. The, the you know what have you been reading? And, and on that. You know, we're exposed to the internet now. You talked about birth control pills as a good example. There'll be so much literature out there that will tell you that birth controls are like 
birth control pills are really bad for you and they're, they're fucking you up in different ways. And there'll be other literature out there that say they're fantastic and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, same with uh, have breast milk and, uh, and um, formula milk. Formula, you know? yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. You know, with how do you handle and make decisions given the fact that there's so much shit out there? It's tough, especially when it's something that you it is so outside your experience and it has so much to do with your own chemical makeup that you can't necessarily gain a lot from somebody else's experience. Um, that's why I think something like birth control pills is tough because a lot of women say that it actually improved their mood, like mm. I, 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 which, is, which was shocking to me. But that just goes to show you, as we know from poker, we are only a sample size of one and a lot of things you just have to try out for your own to find out. And uh, I guess you, you have to respect your personal experience, especially if, if it recurs, right? Hmm. You know, I, I obviously believe in doctors and science, but especially with things that haven't been studied as much, because of course, they're more concerned about like, you know, extremely depressed people or, you know, side effects that are going to cause like, you know, uh, something that will put you in the hospital for weeks. Whereas, you know, somebody who just suddenly isn't effective and uh, isn't able to enjoy life, it you know, maybe not as 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 uh, interesting or something that they necessarily bothered studying, right? Yeah, I always remember when uh, when Zia was born and we had to talk about vaccinations. When Jude was born, my my son, eighteen years ago, it was just, "Mom, what do we do now?" Oh, he has to go and get these vaccinations. Oh, okay, right, we'll take him to the doctors. But today, it's like vax vax of what? Right, I need to look that up and. <gasps> Oh my god you're gonna have autism oh my god they're gonna save the world and it, it it's a really difficult decision you know do you do you make decisions very quickly or do you, are you one of those people who gets the food menu and an hour later you're still kind of choosing which you want you want um i can be either way but i do like to make i do like to identify things that i know nothing about and then um just pass on the decision making to somebody else like vaccinations would be a great example i feel that the pediatric uh, practice that we go through just tells us what to do and we just do it. And, you know, I'm aware that maybe in 10 years they'll say like, you know, actually that vaccination was like not the best combination and, or that wasn't the right age to do it. So we're going to improve it. I mean, I'm aware that might happen, but right now I certainly don't have better information than the people at the highly rated office that we go to. And I'm not going to find out better things by wasting three hours on Google and you know, that's going to cut into my other income stream. Yeah. <laughs> I'm exactly the same. I'm exactly the same. I, I'm just kind of like, fuck, I really have to think about this thing. Wow, that's going to take up so much of my time and I don't have that time. So what's the kind of rational thing here? I, and I'm just like, okay, I, I think they should be vaccinated. But here's the interesting thing. Then what if your wife turns around and says, oh, no, 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 no. I, I do not want vaccinations. Um, do you ever bump into like, real how do you how do you manage uh real value clashes with not not just not just your husband but with people in general like how how do you navigate them yeah value clashes like something for instance somebody doesn't believe that doesn't believe in private schools or charter schools and thinks you're like a bad person for sending your kids to them I mean, I, 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 I plan to send my son to public school, but, you know, if we get into a good charter school and we send him there instead, I, I would certainly consider it. Um, and I, yeah, definitely I have some friends who believe that, you know, you, you have to invest in the public school system because if the more invested parents don't, then that's bad for society. Uh, I don't agree with that because I think that there's also some value in creating competition in a market. So I would just have to, not that I'm a huge expert, this isn't something I'd study in depth, but I definitely know a little bit about both sides and I can sympathize with both. But as the fact that I see both sides means that, you know, it, depending on what schools uh, Fabian gets into, I'm just going to make the best decision for him because uh, it's not really about my belief system. It's about like what he wants to do in that case. So I, I think, uh, I would try to change the subject with them, I guess, because usually it's going to be hard to get somebody to believe in markets in a short period of time. What is the, <laughs> what is the, so if, if, 
I don't talk about what my work around alcoholism unless somebody asks me what I do. And then when they ask me what I do, I kind of go all in, right? Because I'm, I'm fully aware that if I try to talk to some people about it, there will be kind of like a death effect. They, they just wouldn't be able to hear what I'm saying. They just rationally, logic, they just wouldn't be able to get it. And I am aware of that uh, in the work that I do. What's the, what's the one contrarian view that you hold that, um, that if you was at a poker table that somebody was kind of like taking the opposite view or maybe the majority are that you feel that you'd have to pipe up? Contrarian view, like something I believe that most people don't believe. Mm, yeah. Um, well, what are some things that like poker players believe in universally so I can say which ones I don't? Hmm. <laughs> I don't, at the moment, they seem to think that aliens exist <laughs> and people are getting abducted by aliens. I guess nah. I, um, I think that uh, I'm trying to think of some stuff that I've said recently. I mean, I, I noticed that when the uh, topless dealer in Malta thing happened, I felt... I felt really bad, especially when I realized how horribly the dealers were treated, but I actually didn't think it was that bad of an idea if the dealers and participants were willing. I thought it was kind of interesting. I guess sometimes I I am looking for a good story and good visuals in once in a while. I, I think that can create some contrarian views i certainly don't like good structures in poker tournaments i think that they should be like eight hours long and like the only way to make that happen is to make the structure shallower um so that's like a very specific view i'm sure i think i'm sure you're think, looking for something more philosophical okay i guess one thing even though i love the i have mixed feelings about effective giving i think it's really important to give to effective charities but i also believe in local giving mm. Because I think it's important to empower people who are local because then it can spread out, like not just because I don't think giving charitably is only about giving wealth. I think it's also about giving power. And that's why giving to education, I think, is very important because we want to like flatten out the power in America. Too many of the people, it's not just about wealth. Too many people have too much of the power. Too few people have too much power. And I think that that's dangerous for society. And that's why I think giving in the United States, even if the money would go further in other parts of the world, I think it's still extremely important. And if I become rich, like very rich, my giving strategy will not only look at the dollar value, it will also look at things in America. And I think that's a somewhat unpopular view. I, I think that the, the going trend in high stakes poker is all about effective giving. And I think that makes sense from a poker point of view. Like, why not? Like, this is economics. You want to save the most number of lives. So I certainly understand the point of view. But I, it, I kinda, it kind of struck me when I started thinking about how giving is not just about money, but it's also about power that I started thinking a little bit beyond that and my own strategies. Yeah, I, I remember seeing William McCaskill uh, in San Francisco, and he he realized that this was an issue, that, that actually people would be put off about yeah. such altruism. So he, he said, hey, imagine you have two pots. In one pot, you put your money in that's going to be used for effective altruistic purposes, and then you have this other pot of money uh, that you're going to do what the hell you like with. And that's, that's a cool strategy, right? And, and uh, I, could, I could physically see, like, everybody in the audience, the shoulders kind of like, oh, yeah. I mean, me for, me for one, like, I think I was the first ever person to join Reg. I was like reg number one. And for a long time, I felt really guilty that I was helping people stop drinking alcohol because uh, alcohol kills 3.3 million people a year and smoking kills 9 million. And smoking is more likely to be on effective altruism radar and you're more likely to get support mm -hmm. than you are with alcohol. Um, but um, yeah, uh, I, guess, I guess who you surround yourself with and, those, and having different opinions is really important as well, you know, so... Well, also, but with you, I think you can explain that, though, because you are probably uniquely equipped to make better use of your time by helping people with alcoholism because you have like all these unique insights. Mm. So even if like smoking is a, is a more dangerous vice, you might be better spending your time. But I just think that the fact that one of the core principles, like because I did read um, 
Peter Singer, it's, it's, that's his name, right? Peter Singer yeah, in, yeah. back in college is that it's actually immoral to use money for things that aren't effective. I think that's where it becomes complicated, yeah. but you know, but that's, I mean, that's okay. Like, I guess it's just the idea is like, obviously we're not going to be perfect. Um, but I, I would even argue that it's not about perfection in that case, because I think that the power dynamics of a society that you live in are very important that you pay taxes in and that you don't want to flow all the money out of that society because you were lucky enough to benefit. So that's why I, it's something that, you know, we're not going to solve in this conversation, mm. but something that I think about a lot and that I think is definitely not the majority viewpoint in charity in the poker world. And I think what is important of this discussion is that these discussions take place and we don't feel like we're unable to have these discussions, which takes us back to the point I was making earlier on about sex and that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah, about gender and sex. Well, and- just just being able, like being, let's say we're at a poker table with Lippery, Igor Kurganov, uh, Philip Grusom, uh, Martin Jacobson, right? You should be able to talk about your views being different and not being respected and not being vilified for it and feel that you're going to be vilified for it. That That's what I'm saying I think is is wrong in my little, my world. My very small world. Like I feel like whenever I decide I want to talk, I like talking about stuff that other people don't talk about, right? Um, and I get told uh, uh, very often, what, why did you talk about that? Why did you touch upon that? Um, why did you share that? That's the other one I get. Why are you sharing that? Why are you such an open book? You know, why? And I'm like, why wouldn't I want to be? Like this, these are really interesting, important conversations, you know, and, I want my daughter to have them as well, but I also wanted to be have the skills when to use them and when not to use them type of thing. But I think the way the world is going at the moment, people, I mean, I just listened to a podcast with Sam Harris on anti-Semitism, right? And 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 they were talking about um I think he was interviewing a Jewish reporter, right? Like about how scary it would be to openly show that you're a jewish like in paris or something like that like you know that that it, like are you then going to be a writer and write about that like you're pouring that attention onto you that you don't want which i think is pretty sad like i don't like we're not going to fix it we're not going to fix those things on this call but it goes back to us being a little kid and being picked on because we're weird i like that weirdness if everybody was the fucking same then life would be pretty boring right yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. And I think now people like to stand out and that's kind of changed yeah. in our in our era of social media where people really want to stand out. Like I was reading this interesting study about how names are generally much less common now than they used to be. So the most common name might only be like a few percent of kids in a certain class, whereas it used to be like the most common name would be like 20% of the class. Uh, So people are actually endeavoring to pick names that nobody else will pick, but aren't too weird, which is, yeah, that, that that's interesting. Whereas before that wasn't really the goal. So yeah, I think uh, that's interesting. As for having conversations at the poker table, you know, dangerous thing there is if you have a, conversation that's too good and serious at a poker table you can get really distracted and just start not playing well so (laughs) it depends on the tournament or you could lose your shit or you could lose your shit you can get really angry you could get really angry and now you're now you've got like an emotion you probably don't want i know and that's that's one of the problems with bullying at the poker table like sometimes i think that people don't get as fired up as they should because they don't want to like detract from their own game you know, mm. you suddenly like instead of strategizing and playing a strategy game, you're like dealing with this like completely separate issue. Right. Mm. Like like when it happens to me, when people are abusing the dealers and I defend the dealer, I definitely feel that I did the right thing. But afterwards, I'm certainly distracted if I'm like, you know, arguing back and forth with somebody at the table all of a sudden instead of watching the action. Yeah. You know, so you have you definitely want to pick and choose those those spots, right? And oh not get into God. it. It's just poker is just such a microcosm of life, right? Yeah, not just get into an argument about the minimum wage while you're playing like 
the final table of some event, right? It, it just reminds me of like, I remember once when I was a kid, like standing at a bus stop and this kid getting beaten up and uh, same type of thing. It's like, do I get involved here? Like, or do I not get involved here? And, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, it's a really difficult one, but for another time. Right, let's go to special worlds again. So we touched upon it a little bit earlier on, but I'm interested. So chess was a special world for you. How, how did it, how did it feel the first time you you go into that world and how did it feel and compare the first time you entered the poker world? Because, and do, do you even feel that they're special worlds or were they just order, always ordinary worlds to you? No, I feel like chess is a special world where you get to enter this land of, you know, mental combat where you're kind of existing outside time and space in mental combat with another person. I love chess for that. But it's also just so incredibly intense and 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 competitive and uh, a little bit narrow. It is chess. Chess is chess. And while it contains many great life lessons, it doesn't have as much natural overlap into other fields as some things like poker and finance and money, for instance. There's a lot of like natural overlap. So that's the special world of chess. I think the special world of poker is this adventure, the fun of having a reason to play and the the people that you meet through that. So that is a special world to me as well, the world of poker. What very often, and this, this happened to me, is I, I worked on the railway, so the railway was my ordinary world, that path of least resistance. And then I got into poker. Poker was my special world. But then very quickly, poker becomes your ordinary world. Um, yeah. So what's, what's your, what's your, what's your, what are your special worlds that you're looking to go on an adventure and, and reach at some point in life? What other special worlds would I like to get into? Well, I, I feel like I never really properly studied math. And to me, that's like an incredibly compelling world. I had to study some math for various poker ideas that I was working on. Uh, but when I did that, I really regretted not studying math earlier in life because I think it's an absolutely beautiful world. I also still want to get into the world of more physical coordination through dance. So th- those are two worlds that I still feel like I can get more into. It's just more physical flow. Um, I've always been such a mental person, writing, chess, poker. And I did take CrossFit for a couple years, but I always felt that I was thinking too much. So I would be doing like a, a clean and I was never able to, I was very strong, but I was never able to execute my strength because when I tried to do something dynamic with my strength, mm. I would think too much and lose it. And so I, I'd still like to get to that point where I'm really able to perform better um, and flow more physically instead of always just thinking all the time. It's funny you said dance there. Back to that article I'm doing about the seven high habits of highly effective poker players. Dance actually came up um, through one of the 50 people that we talked about as a, an effective habit to prepare yourselves for the poker world. So there you are, poker players out there. Huh? Get dancing. You got your headphones on, you know, you get dancing as well. Dancing. Wow. I wouldn't have expected that to be one of the seven highly effective. No, no, no. It's not, it's not one of the seven. It's not one of the seven. <laughs> it's not one of the seven. Um, but it, it came up as one player's top three was dancing. Yeah. Yeah. But wow. Was, wow. Yeah. So you wouldn't believe how varied it was asking 50 people. There were so many different habits in there. It was really pretty cool. So on that, what, what are your what are your good habits and what are your bad habits? My good habits, I guess, in poker or just in life? Life. Same thing, I guess. Well, in poker, I feel like I don't tilt that much, so that's good. I do sometimes, but I feel like maybe a little less than than many people. Um, And then I – yeah, so that's that's pretty important. Um, I'm able to detach myself from money for the most part. part. And – I'm able to do that in life as well. So those are some of my good habits. I I have a a great propensity for deep focus, probably 
partly because of who I am, but also partly because of my career in chess. Mm. So it's like another g- good habit. I am able to just kind of like get into that elemental, deep focus state that can be hard for some people to reach. And bad habits, I'm not that disciplined. It's like I have to, if I want to make myself do something, I have a lot of strategies for that. Like I'll just teach myself to like the thing, but I, I won't just, I, whereas I feel like some people can be like, uh, can actually just ha- make themselves do something that they don't like. I can't do it that way. I have to basically like circulate it and just like, you know, create this cognitive change so that I actually like X. Whereas other people I think can actually just force themselves to do X. That's mm. never been my way. And I kind of, I think that that actually bizarrely um, often makes me take like a more circuitous path. <laughs> yeah, it, so- it sounds like it would take you longer to get into something because you have to spend the time to change the neurological connections to actually like it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Or, or some, it's some kind of trick like that. I mean, luckily I like a lot of things. I like working out. I like working. So I, I like a lot of things. See, I mean, I made it work. I made well, it I guess, work. I guess writing a book is a good one, right? I imagine you really love writing, but when you write, write your books, there's times when you sit down and you don't really want to write. Yeah, you, and they're, they're where you have to really love the final product and the mission mm. and the mm. vision. That's where you have to have that passion so that you're willing to go through the more difficult parts. But I never, there was never something that I just didn't like, you know what I mean? Uh, But discipline, like for instance, with eating better, stuff like that, with, uh, you know, checking your phone less. I I think there are certain things that other people are better at just being disciplined about. And I have to go a different route because that's never been my style. Hmm. And just just to mop that up a little bit, Every major story has a villain, like a big badass kind of Emperor Palpatine or a Darth Vader. But we touched upon depression as, as likely being a Palpatine or a Darth Vader. We touched upon some bad habits there. Are there any other villains in your life that you've had to overcome? And it, and it doesn't have to be a person. It could be a, it could be a belief system. It could be a, a thought. It could be a, an animal. I don't know. It could be anything. Any other villains guess, we've missed? I guess the other people's opinions. Because I don't even really think depression is a villain. It was only when, like, I was taking those birth control pills so that it blew up into Mm. a monster. But otherwise, I actually kind of find it an asset because I think that it's inherently tied into, like, more happy spells that have probably made me who I am and who, which which give me a lot of creative ideas. I think that if my moods were flatter, I I just don't know if I would have come up with half the ideas I've come up with in my life. From all these art projects I've done with my husband to chess bitch to the grid, like I have to play like a girl to I, I've I come up with like a lot of weird ideas that I actually end up doing. And I really believe that these fluctuations from depression to extreme happiness are related to that. I could be wrong. Maybe I'm just reluctant to throw it all away, but I I think that that is true. And it's just about controlling it so that they don't get too crazy. Hmm. I mean, when I um, when I looked at the grid, when I was kind of like researching for this interview, like I, I was like, oh, I've really got to listen to another poker podcast. And then I downloaded it. I was like, oh, this is different. You know, I mean, it, is there a thought process there that's, that's like we've got to do a podcast so it has to be different to everything else that's out there so it stands out? Or is it that just who you are? No, I, I definitely felt like I, if I was going to do a poker podcast, it had to be different and I had to kind of showcase some of my unique qualities, like uh, my artistic creations and my like weird collection projects. I, I absolutely felt it had to because there's a lot of poker podcasts out there. Hmm. And I think that, you know, yours is it's clearly very different. And mine, I thought, had to be different because, you know, I'm not as as well known as some people who might have poker podcasts. So I want to make sure that, you know, it has some potential to success. And I also wanted to be interested in it because otherwise a lot of podcasters quit. So if you don't believe in your product and really have passion for it, then there's a good chance you're going to quit. So I I, I had to love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you you did something really smart there as well. I don't know if you did that on purpose, but by choosing every playable hand in 
poker or no limit or whatever or Texas Hold'em, you have to finish it. <laughs> you know, like Eddie, if you if you was like I can I can change I can stop this anytime, right? We're doing we're doing one season now. We might not do a second season, and the one season might be fantastic. But it doesn't have to end because there's, there's there's no reason to end it. You have to end yours. You have to get every single person to say say a, a different card combination. I, I, you know, was that deliberate or is that just an accident? No, that is pretty much deliberate. Although some people still don't think I'm going to finish it. No, you. But what I tell them is like anything in life, and certainly in art and creation. It's much more interesting if you don't know what's actually going to happen, mm. right? So yeah. maybe I won't finish it, but I think I will. And this is, this is of course, my podcast, The Poker Grid, where I interview 169 um, people about different hand combos from aces to seven deuce off. Hopefully, you'll pick a hand for me, Lee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've, well uh, I'd love to do that. Yeah, definitely. Um, It'd be cool if it would be something that ties into your other work, you know, because I, I really would love to hear more about that, about, you know, recovery and all of the concepts behind that. I'll, I'll send you the name of that book in case I got it wrong, because I'm going to be really curious to hear what you think of it. Yeah, I, um, I haven't read a book like that for a long, long time. Because oh, you let, don't like to? No, okay. no, it's not. It's not that. Well, let's talk about that off air because I know you. Yeah. I know you got to get off. Let me ask you one one last question, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll let you go. Um, every hero's journey ends with the hero getting their treasure. They beat the villain, they get their treasure, and then they go back to their ordinary world as a changed man or a changed woman, and they, you know, they do something magical there with the new experience and the skills and you know all that kind of stuff that they got. Um, with you now, with the rest of your life ahead of you, what is your treasure uh, going to be, and, uh, and how are you going to? Once you get that, how is it going to change you? And um, I mean, you, you might already be in the in the process of doing it, but well, the, of course, my son was the treasure, little yeah. Fabian. Yeah, and you know, a lot of great things have happened to me over the course of my career. You know, like signing with Poker Stars, and you know winning the um, first open face high roller tournament. Like, I mean, just a lot. I, I really feel like I've been pretty lucky in my career doing commentary for the St. Louis chess club um, in some of the best tournaments that ever have been hosted in chess. And also a lot of opportunities to show my passion for women in chess by raising money, by art projects. So I think that, I've been pretty fortunate and the treasure will be having more time and being a little bit less. We, we talked earlier in the podcast about side hustles and multiple income streams. And I'm very grateful for that as it's allowed me so much flexibility, but I would like to kind of narrow it down a little bit as I'm, time goes by. I feel like that will be the true treasure being able to focus a little bit more. I think, um, I think you could do, I mean, if you consider all the wonderful things you've done in the world in so many different diverse areas, it's pretty terrifying to think what you could do if you focused on just one thing, but um, that might not be as fun. Uh, Jennifer, thank you very much for being our guest on The Hero's Journey and I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you, Lee. Great podcast.